A car or bike that idles rough, stalls in gear, is a bear to drive in traffic, and gets abysmal gas mileage is still pretty cool, if it rocks when you nail it. An engine that suffers these drivability headaches and still gets blown away by a Chevette is the worst possible hot rodding experience. The most prevalent reason for engines that don't run as they should typically is an improper camshaft for the engine and the vehicle combination. And that's understandable because choosing a cam is one of the hardest, most confusing, and most often misunderstood parts of building an engine. The counter guy at the local parts store, or the quick lube, the food mart, or even your buddy that only knows you online isn't always the best source of information. So knowing the approximate cam specs for your combination is vital to an enjoyable machine, be it full race or a full cruiser. Today I'm going to arm you with the information you need to help you choose the perfect camshaft. So stay tuned. Choosing a camshaft, be it for your car or your bike, can be a problem. The problem is that there are many things to consider when choosing a cam and it involves much more than just the other engine parts. The entire vehicle and the sum of its parts are just as important. Today I'll give you an outline of what all those specs and numbers mean in the camshaft catalog and a general explanation of how they affect performance followed by a rundown of the areas that must be addressed at cam selection time. This information is guaranteed to make your next cam choice almost painless, if not completely enjoyable. We'll concentrate on the spectrum covering pure cruiser touring bikes and cars to fairly quick bracket racers and sort of street cars and bikes. Race cars or anything that runs quicker than say 11 seconds and a quarter mile is a whole other ball of wax and we'll save that for another video. Before we get started, I'd like to say thanks to our newest channel members. If you enjoy our content and you'd like to support our efforts to bring you content just like this, you can click the card above for more information on becoming a channel member, or you can get in touch with us next time you need to order parts. We can get you pretty much anything for your ride. Also, by the end of the video, if you feel I've earned your subscription, please click subscribe below and ring the bell so you'll get notified next time we post a video. All too often, people will look at a dyno sheet and use that alone to determine which cam to pick. Remember, a dyno sheet is typically only a reflection of peak performance at wide open throttle, most often in fourth gear on a bike. This is not an overall assessment of how the vehicle will perform in all other everyday conditions. When you're comparing cams, once you understand the numbers, you'll have a better idea of which cam would be the right one for you. The best cam for your overall riding habits may not be the cam that produces the most peak power on a dyno. So you simply can't judge the cam by the dyno sheet alone unless racing is your only primary purpose. This is the cam out of a GMC 302 cubic inch inline six. And this is a cam out of a twin cam Harley. They both serve the same purpose and all of these principles will apply. As I talk about each aspect of the cam, I'll point to it so you can see exactly what it is we're talking about. So let's start with valve timing. Both the intake and the exhaust lobes on a cam are timed relative to when they open and close and are typically based on degrees of crankshaft rotation. Both are equally important, but intake close is one you should pay particular attention to. When the intake valve closes is a key factor in determining how much cylinder pressure the engine will produce. This must be taken into consideration along with compression ratio to avoid tuning issues and detonation. The earlier the intake valve closes, the more cylinder pressure you will make and often more power but fuel octane, altitude, strength of your starting system and your chosen tuning system should all be taken into consideration. 
Just as the other attributes, more isn't always better. Now valve lift is the measurement of the distance a valve opens off of its seat. Because this spec tells us how much the valves are opening, the higher the lift, the more open the valve. It also gives us a clue as to how much air is flowing in and out of the cylinder. This has a direct effect on the amount of torque and power your engine will produce. In general, higher lift cams will produce more mid and high RPM power, however, Depending on the aggressiveness of the cam low profiles, high lift cams may also require stronger valve springs and lighter weight valve train components. Also, depending on your valve sizes and port design, you can have too much lift, which will slow down port velocity and will greatly reduce low to mid-range power. Lift shown on the spec card is not actually the height of the cam lobe. Final lift is determined by the height of the lobe multiplied by the ratio of the rocker arm. Most lift specs are reported with stock ratio rocker arms, so if you're changing from say a 1.6 to a 1.7 ratio rocker, you will have more lift at the valve. So you have to pay more attention to what rocker arm is being used when your lift spec is provided by the cam manufacturer. Duration is the amount of time measured in degrees of crankshaft rotation in which a valve is off its seat or open. Duration at 50 thousandths of an inch is the industry standard for determining duration and begins measuring from the, the valve from opening from the point of 50 thousandths lift. The confusing thing about duration is the difference between advertised and at 50 thousandths lift duration. At 50 thousandths lift duration is measured from the point where the cam moves the lifter up 50 thousandths of an inch and up until the point 50 thousandths before the lifter is all the way back down. Most cam manufacturers differ in where they start and finish measuring for advertised duration. Some will start at 4 thousandths of an inch, some maybe at 8 thousandths, and some measure it somewhere in between. That's why the 50 thousandths lift numbers are the best to go by. Because duration is the amount of time an intake or exhaust valve is open, it is the determining factor for how much air or fuel fills the cylinders during each combustion cycle. This has a direct effect on combustion, fuel usage, and overall power output. As engine RPM increases, the valves open and close more quickly, making it harder for the air fuel charge to fill the cylinders. So by increasing the duration and keeping your valves open longer, you can increase the amount of air and fuel fed into the cylinders at high RPM operation. More duration is ideal for high RPM power. Less duration fosters more low-end torque. Basically, the lower your duration, the lower your torque range will come in, and here you can take advantage of higher port velocities and cylinder fill percentages. But again, making more low to mid-range torque at slower piston speeds quite often is the most ideal for heavyweight touring bikes. Lobe separation angle is defined as the number of degrees separating the peak lift points of the intake and exhaust lobes. The separation of the cam lobe peaks has an effect on idle quality, peak torque, engine vacuum, and cam RPM range, all the stuff we care about. Lobe separation also creates engine vacuum, which is important if you're using power brakes on a car or an automatic transmission. A cam with a wider lobe separation, say around 112 to 116 degrees, allows torque to be spread over a larger portion of the engine's RPM range and offers better power throughout the upper RPM range. Narrower lobe separation, say under 112 degrees, will foster good low RPM torque and good acceleration, but will generally keep peak torque concentrated in the smaller area of the RPM range. Now overlap is the point measured in degrees of crank rotation when the intake and exhaust valves are open simultaneously. This occurs at the end of the exhaust stroke when the exhaust valve is closing and the intake is opening. By having the intake and exhaust valve open simultaneously, the open exhaust port can produce a bit of a scavenging effect that will help pull the air fuel mixture into the combustion chamber. 
This can lead to increased combustion and horsepower. But less overlap typically offers an improved low RPM response and increased fuel efficiency. More overlap provides an improved signal to a carburetor with high RPM power potential. This is also a critical point when you have an engine with valves angled toward each other like in a Harley. Since both are off their seat at the same time, depending on valve size, they can come very close to each other. If your heads have been modified, knowing exactly what your valve to valve clearance is at TDC makes knowing TDC lift of the cam extremely important. Otherwise, you can trash your engine. Now intake center line is defined as the point of peak lift on the intake lobe in relationship to top dead center of the piston. By advancing or retarding the intake center line, you can alter your engine's power band. By advancing intake center line, you'll shift the basic RPM range downward slightly from the original intended power band. By retarding the center line, you'll move the RPM range upward. So all that said, the best advice I could offer you is to first decide for yourself how you want the bike or car to behave. From there, you've got to build an entire engine and drivetrain to fit. People tend to start with the cam choice, but everything about the engine combination and intended function must be decided upon before choosing the cam. Once this is determined, details like the engine's compression ratio, the basic power range of the heads, intake, manifold, the carb, the exhaust, throttle body, the, the, all that combination, the, the weight, and even if we're talking automotive, the transmission type or the torque converter stall speed, for example, your gear ratios, your tire sizes, all of that should be taken into consideration. Because there's an almost infinite number of combinations of all of these parameters, it would take forever for me to explain the intricacies of how all these parts work together with the cam. But I hope this basic overview will arm you with a better understanding of the wonderful world of camshafts. No one single company makes the perfect camshaft for everyone, but there is the perfect camshaft out there for you. Thanks for watching. Please leave some comments below and let me know what you thought about the video and some of your experiences with choosing cams. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.